Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over part two of an NCLEX review over pneumonia. What I want to be covering are the nursing interventions and the medications used to treat pneumonia. Now be sure to watch part one because that builds upon this video. I discuss the patho, the risk factors, the different types, and the signs and symptoms of pneumonia. And as always over here on the side or in the description below you can access the notes and the quiz that go along with this lecture. So let's get started. First let's talk about nursing interventions. What are you going to do for this patient as the nurse? Okay first thing you want to do is you want to monitor that respiratory system because with pneumonia our respiratory system is what is having trouble. So what you're going to do is you're going to be auscultating those lung sounds. Typically with pneumonia we learned this in part one you could expect to hear maybe some coarse crackles or wheezing, also known as bronchi, or bronchial breath sounds, which are normal breath sounds if heard in the tracheal area, but if heard in the peripheral lung fields, this could represent lung consolidation. So you want to be listening to that. You want to see if they're improving or if they're getting worse. Another thing is you want to monitor those vital signs. How is that respiratory rate? Are they tachypenic? Um, what's that oxygen saturation? Is it less than 95% or 90? Where do we want them? Also, you want to not only look at that, but you want to see how their skin color is. Are they cyanotic? One thing that um, if a patient is not getting good oxygen supply, the first thing that you will notice, I have seen it many times as a nurse, is where they start to turn blue is in their lips, the pink color of their lips. All of a sudden, you'll start seeing the lips start turn lightly purple, purple, and then they'll start to turn blue. And then you give them more oxygen and then they'll turn a nice rosy red color again. So assess those lips and especially the skin to see if they're getting enough oxygen because that's a telltale sign. Also monitor their arterial blood gas results. Physicians will order this. It'll come up in your computer. You need to report if anything is getting too abnormal. Are they retaining way too much carbon dioxide and they're super hypoxemic where they have low oxygen in the blood. They may need to be placed on BiPAP or mechanical ventilation. So you always want to look at their arterial blood gases and compare it with the previous ones that they had. Also, your job, if ordered, is to collect a sputum culture. A lot of times if a patient's admitted with pneumonia, there will be an order set that says collect sputum culture. And um, you'll give them something to cough and spit their sputum in. You'll send it off so they can see what is causing this pneumonia. Also, as a nurse, you'll be watching the respiratory system, but you'll need to assess when they need suction. A lot of times you may have to do it nasotracheally, go in through the nose, down through the trachea, and um, suction them, especially if um, all of a sudden there's just so much mucus, so much going on, they can't breathe, and you need to go in there and get it out really fast so they can breathe. And um, assess their need for respiratory breathing treatments. A lot of places have respiratory therapists that will administer those, but as the nurse, it's your responsibility to um, Make sure if the patient needs one that you call them, if the breathing treatment's ordered as needed. A lot of times with patients with pneumonia, they will be scheduled so the respiratory therapist will be on the floor routinely giving your patient whatever the doctor's ordered. A lot of times what will be ordered is like bronchodilators. Sometimes chest percussion therapy may be ordered, but respiratory therapy will do that for you. And another thing you wanna do is educating, educating the patient about the following. Incentive spirometer usage. I did a whole NCLEX review on incentive spirometer. You can access it in a card above if you want to watch how to use an incentive spirometer and what to expect, what kind of test questions you may be tested on with an IS. But with an incentive spirometer, this helps the patient um, deep breathe. And um, what will hopefully happen, it'll pop open those sacs, get that air moving, get that mucus out so we can help them get better. They'll want to use that 10 times every one to two hours while awake. Another thing is that they want, you want to keep them hydrated. Um, they'll be running a fever, so that causes dehydration, and respiratory alone um, causes a person to lose about 300 to 400 milliliters of water per day. And this will help keep the secretions thin because if they come de become dehydrated, those mucus that mucus will become thick and hard to cough and get up. 
However, patients with contraindications like heart failure, renal failure, you would not want to give them this much fluid. So you need, it's based on per patient what's going on with them. So always assess that. Another thing is, if you have a patient who's immobile, you want to uh, make sure you're turning them frequently to keep secretions moving and have their head of the bed up at least 30 degrees, especially while eating because um, they're at risk for aspiration, aspirating their GI contents or food that they're eating into the lungs, which can cause pneumonia in itself, but make the pneumonia a lot worse. Another thing, big thing, is make sure that they are aware and they are up to date with their vaccines. They're getting the annual flu shot because as we learned in part one, viruses can cause pneumonia. A lot of times a patient will have the flu, um, it's hurt their immune system, it's made them more susceptible to the germs in the environment and they developed pneumonia. Also, for patients who are 65 or older or from 19 to 64 with risk factors like they live in a long-term care facility, they have um, issues where they're more susceptible to catching pneumonia. There's a, uh, a vaccine called Pneumovax where they can get that every five years to help prevent from some forms of pneumonia. So let them know that. Also for your patients who smoke, um, help them um, figure out ways to quit smoking because this increases the chances of reoccurrent pneumonia. Um, also educate them about avoiding sick people and especially during um, peak seasons of flus going out and crowds will increase their chances and the importance of hand hygiene. Always washing the hands, using hand sanitizer while they're out in the public, especially before they eat. And another thing we will be doing as a nurse is administering medications, whatever the doctor ordered. Um, this typically includes antipyretics, keep the fever down, flu, IV fluids to keep them hydrated. Um, if it's a viral cause, they will not be ordered antibiotics because antibiotics are for bacterial forms of pneumonia, but you may be giving antivirals like Tamiflu or something like that. Now, let me talk more in depth about the antibiotics that are used to treat pneumonia, the, categories, uh, the category of drugs. There are various antibiotics that are used to treat pneumonia, and the drug use depends on the type of bacteria that is causing the infection, if the patient can tolerate it, or if they're allergic to it, or something like that. So, here are the drug categories that are typically used to treat various cases of bacterial pneumonia. And to help you remember those, I have developed this mnemonic to help you remember them. And each letter at the beginning of the word correlates with its drug category. So remember, various medications frequently treat pneumonia cases. Okay, the first one is vancomycin. This isn't a drug category, it's the name of a drug specifically, and it's the only one out of these. Um, but vancomycin is used to treat severe cases because it's one of the antibiotics left that can treat resistant bacteria. However, um, it's rare, but this drug can cause what's called ototoxicity, where it can cause hearing loss. So monitor your patients, listen to your patients. If your patient starts complaining of, I'm hearing this loud ringing in my ears all of a sudden or roaring or something like that, it could be um, the beginning of hearing loss caused by this medication. So remember that, NCLEX purposes, nursing lectures, that's a big one that always stands out. Okay, next drug, the M for microlids. Some drugs included in this are like z pack Zithromax. This is a narrow spectrum antibiotic and it treats mainly gram positive and it's used in patients who have a penicillin, a penicillin allergy. So if they're allergic to penicillin, chances are they'll be prescribed this medication. Another drug used are called, are called tetracyclines and a popular one um, is called doxycycline and this is a broad, a broad spectrum antibiotic. Treats both gram positive and gram negative, has a broader range. However, um, this is not for pregnant patients because it can cause um, fetal retardation of growth, can discolor teeth, and it's not for children less than eight because of the discoloration of teeth. Also, it can increase the ch your patient's chances of getting a sunburn outside. It makes the skin very photosensitive. So educate them about that. Also, educate your patients who are taking birth control. Ask them if they're on doxycycline, 
they're young or um, within childbearing age, ask them if they're on birth control because this can decrease the effectiveness of birth control and they need to use another method to prevent pregnancy. Also, when taking this medication, do not take milk products or antacids while taking the medication because it can uh, affect the absorption of the tetracycline antibiotic. Okay, another one is called fluoroquinolones. Popular one used is called Leviquin. This is a broad spectrum antibiotic as well. Treats both gram positive and gram negative. It is used um, to treat severe infections just like the vancomycin and um, it, especially those resistant forms. However, this drug has a lot of black box warnings from the FDA on it because it can cause some really nasty side effects. So watch the following. Um, any type of infections like C. diff, this is a gastrointestinal infection where um, pretty much this antibiotic has just killed every, um, your normal flora of your gut and has allowed this clostridium bacteria to invade the patient um, will have profuse diarrhea, frequent, frequent um, episodes of it, and it will have a horrific smell. So if your patient starts having that, you may want to let the physician know so they can send it off for a sample if they're taking this medication because it could be what has caused it. Another thing that has been um, seen with this drug is tendon rupture of the tendons. Say a patient's been taking this, all of a sudden their tendon ruptures happens in young, healthy people. There on this drug has been linked to that. And QT interval prolonged as well. Another drug category called cephalosporins. Um, some drugs that fall into this are like K-Flex or Rocephin. Um, there's different generations of cephalosporins. You have uh, one and two, three and four. Generations three and four tend to be broad spectrum where they target gram positive and gram negative compared to the first and second generations. Um, however, if a patient is allergic to penicillin and um, they may be allergic to cephalosporins as well. There's been a relationship between that. So monitor your patient if they are prescribed this and the physician wants to prescribe this to them all, even though they may be allergic to penicillin, you wanna watch that because they may be allergic to this as well. And the last drug is penicillin. Um, a popular one is penicillin G. This is a narrow spectrum drug, so your only narrow spectrums out of this is your microlids and your penicillins and the early generations of your cephalosporins. And then everything else, third, fourth generations and everything else would be broad spectrum. And you want to monitor them if, they're, if they say they're allergic to cephalosporins, probably won't be prescribed like with the cephalosporin penicillin, they may go ahead and prescribe them like um, a microlid just in case, but sometimes they'll still prescribe it because they don't know if it's a true penicillin allergy. So watch that. And um, this also decreases the effectiveness of birth control. So um, make sure you assess if your patient is on birth control medicine. So that is part two of pneumonia, specifically the nursing interventions and medications. Be sure to watch part, watch part one. And thank you so much for watching. And please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.